All right, we are on the hour, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to our first lecture of the day. My name is Yi, one of the residents at UCSF, and I'll be moderating this session. And uh, this morning, we are uh, proud to introduce Dr. Nora Kern from University of Virginia to talk to us about uh, VUR. Thanks, Yi. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to give this talk to you guys. Um, I decided that I was going to talk about the controversies um, in the diagnosis and management of reflux. As you all know, um, reflux is very much the prostate cancer in the pediatric world. Um, there are a lot of um, no right answers um, in um, how we treat this. And so I wanted to talk about what's out there and um, sort of the various um, things that you may see when you come across um, guidelines and whatnot. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so I have no financial disclosures. So the objectives for today is that we're going to talk about the etiology of reflux, so just the basics of it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the imaging modalities, um, especially given there's one that's a pretty newer modality. Um, I'll talk about the controversies in the diagnosis of reflux when it comes to patients with prenatal hydronephrosis versus those who are diagnosed with a UTI. Um, and then the controversies in the various guidelines that are out there. So to start, um, again, talking about the etiology of reflux. So we do tend to break down reflux into primary versus secondary reflux. Um, we're pr uh, mostly going to be talking about primary reflux, but um, again, that's when there's a fundamental deficiency in the function of the UVJ as an anti-reflux mechanism. And this picture really shows um, exactly what that means. So um, as you, you all know, the ureter is supposed to um, sort of um, implant into the bladder by this tunneling mechanism from the detrusor muscle. Um, and when we do our anti-reflux surgeries, this is what we're actually creating here. Um, in those who do reflux, uh, this is how the ureter does um, tend to enter into the bladder more at an acute angle, which allows that urine to backflow into the kidney. Um, for secondary reflux, this is really a problem with the bladder itself and not really with um, the UVJ where um, elevated bladder pressures increases uh, the risk of urine going into the ureter and into the kidney. So again, we think mostly about bladder dysfunction in these cases. Primarily, we see this with uh, posterior urethral valve kids um, and also with myelomeningocele. To talk a little more specifically about reflux, I broke it down into what I call neonatal reflux as well as reflux that's diagnosed from a UTI. Um, and what I mean by neonatal reflux, um, it's primarily those who are diagnosed due to having a history of prenatal hydronephrosis. Um, so they're uh, highly asymptomatic and um, this is just discovered again because of the hydronephrosis history. Um, so I broke it down mostly because we think of reflux all as one entity, but they are slightly different and you can certainly treat them a little bit differently based on these factors. So with uh, neonatal reflux, it is more commonly seen in boys. It tends to be more high grade. It does uh, tend to improve or resolve um, more than in those with um, reflux from a UTI. And the time to resolution is also less in these cases. It tends to be about 12 months. Um, later uh, for which oftentimes uh, providers will get a repeat VCG in 12 months um, or 18 months, um, again, um, to look for resolution or improvement. Um, in those who've had reflux that are diagnosed from a febrile urinary tract infection, we do more commonly see these in girls. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about this. Bladder and bowel dysfunction plays a large role in these cases there tends to be a higher rate of renal scarring for these kids, so up to 30% versus 10% uh, in those with uh, neonatal reflux. And then the rate of resolution really depends on the age of the patient and the grade of the reflux. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the imaging modalities for reflux. Um, here I've listed them all out and we're gonna go into them um, in some detail. So, Classically, what you all think about when you um, think about diagnosis of reflux is looking at a VCG or avoiding cystic urethrogram. As you all know, there's a grading scale from one to five um, in how we diagnose this. Um, I'll briefly just touch base on this. Um, so grade one, again, it's just um, reflux going into the ureter alone. Grade two is it's going into the ureter as well, into, as, well as into the kidney, but it's not dilating the kidney. 
Um, grade three is when you start to have mild dilation of the renal pelvis, but you still have this cupping of the um, calyces here. Grade four is when you have a lot more dilation of the renal pelvis as well as into the calyces. And then grade five is when you have this hugely blown out kidney with reflux, as well as this serpiginous uh, ureter. Um, this is a newer modality. I don't know how many of you all are um, able to do this at your institutions. We started doing this here at UVA um, in the past year and some change, I believe. But um, this is called a contrast enhanced voiding um, ultrasonography or a SEVIS study. Um, this is a, um, the reason why it's newer is that the contrast that you can see um, by ultrasound uh, was recently approved by the FDA in 2016. Uh, the benefit of it is that it lacks radiation. As you can imagine, it's an ultrasound guided study. It also uses a little bit less sedation. Um, we find this only because in these, um, in these studies, patients can be right next to their parents. You don't have to be under this crazy floor machine where this thing is um, hovering over a child, um, which can be a little more daunting. Um, and so we have been using a little bit less sedation, although you still have to have a catheter, of course, uh, to install the contrast in. And um, ideally, there are equivalent results uh, to a VCUG study. This is a study that was done um, in 2016, which shows the correlation of the CEDA studies to the VCUG. And ideally, you want to see that all of the cases are following this trajectory along this, this line here, where you see that most of the cases are following um, along this grid. You do have some outliers, so I do find it interesting in this one case this, um, in the SEVIS study, they were found to have grade four reflux, and on VCUG, there was grade zero. So, of course, you don't want to see that, but, um, but for the most part, um, it does follow along this um, line of, of good correlation. Um, these sets of images are what the SEVIS study actually looks like. So, um, what you'll get is a side-by-side -side image where there's a grayscale of the, uh, of the ultrasound and then this more orange color um, or yellow color is what the SEVIS study actually looks like. So this is the part that's actually looking at the reflux. Um, this is of course the bladder and this is voiding um, from the urethra. Um, so I do have a poll question, hopefully that will pop up, um, that's gonna ask you to grade the um, reflux in this first um, image here, this top left image. Um, again, as I mentioned to you, the grading is, um, the same as for VCG studies, and so um, I just wanted you all to practice of what uh, what you all thought the grading would be for um, a case like this. All right, so it shows that about 50% of you guys said grade three, and that, that's what I would grade it as. Um, I have a couple people kind of hovering around, around grade two and four. Um, so two, um, this one might be a little bit more on grade um, two. You can see sort of the um, cupping a little more of the uh, fornices, whereas this one, they're a little bit more blunted out, um, just a touch bit more. Um, but I would probably consider this more of a grade three. Um, I don't have really any other images to show you um, kind of grade fours, but, but are, they are pretty classically what you would see, um, again, compared to a VCG. So the next study I'll talk about um, is the radionucleotide cystogram or an RNC. Um, so interestingly, uh, these studies have really become a little bit outdated, or at least um, I have not seen one in my practice yet. Um, and probably the last time I saw one of these was when I was um, in residency. Um, so they're definitely not being done as frequently, but um, they're still kind of um, studies you should know about. Um, the benefits of these studies is that it, of course, avoids um, um, IV contrast agents that you would normally use for a VCG. There is less radiation to this, um, given it's a nuclear medicine study compared to a flora study. Um, mostly it's used for repeat imaging because, um, as you can see here, the images are a little bit grainier, and so they're harder to see. Uh, the anatomical details are not as good um, for an RNC. 
So it might be something you'd want to get for a repeat imaging purposes. Um, it's graded differently though, so it's graded on a scale of one to three, and this is the, um, the grading one, two, and three. Um, and the equivalent again for VCUG studies is that um, an RNC one um, is the same as a VCUG study, um, a grade one for that, so just into the ureter. Um, for RNC two, um, it'd be more similar to a grade two and three for VCUG, and then the grade three is um, more closely related to a grade four and five uh, for VCUG grading. Um, and finally, uh, DMSA scans. Um, again, I don't feel I'm that terribly old, but a lot of these studies are not being done as frequently as they um, used to be doing. Um, uh, again, when I was more in training, uh, this is mostly because DMSA scans um, are in little use, mostly because the tracer is really hard to find. So for example, at my institution, we cannot do these scans because we don't have the tracer. Um, and so that's really the only reason why they're not used. I think they're great scans. Um, what they're doing is that, um, again, the DMSA tracer is being taken up by the proximal um, convoluted tubules, and it's great for looking for cortical activity as well as function. Um, it is the gold standard for diagnosing acute, um, acute polynephritis, um, but it's also great for looking for volume loss um, to look for a chronic um, scar. Um, so I have another poll question. Um, since again, I'm not sure how many of you guys see these um, on a frequent basis. Again, um, my residents do not oftentimes. So um, the question I have for you guys is which image demonstrates a renal scar? So I have almost a 50-50 split. So 60% said this right image and 40% say the, uh, this left image. Um, so the renal scar is actually this right image here. And I'll go through again because I'm guessing you guys don't see as much of this um, necessarily these days. But um, this is what you would see for acute pyelonephritis. So um, this area where you can see it's mostly just grayed out and not completely um, disappeared, that shows a photo photopenic area. So when you can still see the border of the kidney, that indicates that that's an acute event and that's acute pyelonephritis. So you can see it just took a wedge out of this upper part here. Um, versus um, when you're looking at volume loss or a, a chronic scar, what you see is more of the Swiss cheese look or um, sort of a shark bite where it looks like there's no, you can't see this outside border of the kidney um, and all of this area is really blacked out. So that really indicates that that's um, an irreversible scar that you're never going to regain um, versus a more acute event in this case. Um, so, oops, sorry about that. Um, so, talking about the controversies in the diagnosis of um, neonatal reflux. So, again, historically, when I was um, a little bit younger in my training, we would usually um, look at criteria to um, decide if we're going to get a VCUG in the cases of prenatal hydronephrosis. And we would oftentimes use the grade of hydronephrosis to decide um, if we're going to get that VCUG. So um, some have advocated that you should get a VCUG for grades three and four hydronephrosis. Um, this comes from various um, reports, um, but predominantly from there's a pediatric reflux guideline um, from 2010, so a little bit of an older report, as well as the um, AUA guidelines um, in 2017. They also do recommend that you get a VCUG for grades three and four hydronephrosis. Um, then um, back in 2009, um, Dr. Estrada at Children's um, uh, hospital in Boston uh, did a study where he looked at patients and found that um, in patients with grade uh, 2 hydronephrosis, they were able to find about a 30% rate of reflux found. And so um, they said, well, maybe we should be uh, looking at people with grade 2 hydronephrosis um, as criteria to get a VCUG. Um, interestingly, back in Dr. Herndon's earlier age, uh, earlier years, um, so this was back in 99, um, quite a bit ago, he found that um, of 70 patients who had reflux, they found that 25% of them actually had a normal 
ultrasound, so no hydronephrosis at all. So that question, so should everyone then get a VCUG um, because there's still going to be um, a percentage that will have reflux. Um, and then Dr. Lee, again at Boston Children's, um, found that um, this is in a big meta-analysis, um, showed that there's actually no association in the grade of hydronephrosis with detection of reflux. So then that gets us back to square one. What would that criteria be in um, when we would decide to get a VCG? Um, so because of this, um, when I was the fellow at Children's National, um, I know that I was looking at a ton of studies that all had negative VCGs and I thought, well, there is so many people out there who are getting VCGs um, who may not necessarily need them. And is there better criteria that we can think about um, to better hone in on our rates of finding reflux? And so this is a study again that I did when I was a fellow. And what it looked at um, is that we looked at different factors that we would see on an ultrasound that might uh, drive us to get a VCG that would be a better predictor of finding reflux as opposed to the grade of hydronephrosis. So again, we did not look at the grade of hydronephrosis, but we cared mostly about um, the people who had hydroureter, um, a duplication, given we know that reflux tends to happen in the lower pole voidy. And then also in cases of what we call renal dysmorphia or dysplasia, we sort of use that term mostly to, to describe a kidney that's either small or um, a kidney that's echogenic. So again, something that's indicating more of um, reflux nephropathy that might um, again, be a higher um, predictor for finding reflux. And what we found is that if we used any of these three criteria, um, the odds ratio of detecting reflux was quite high at eight. Um, and so, and also the negative post-test probability was 6%, meaning that if we, um, that meaning that a negative finding on ultrasound would make the diagnosis of reflux very unlikely. So again, um, looking at just isolated hydronephrosis alone was not a great factor for finding reflux. Um, furthermore, um, we could also think about things as maybe uh, it's not reflux that we really care about, but it's really the risk of UTI. Um, because again, it's the UTIs um, that are, that are going to cause potential problems for these kids um, with um, renal scarring if there is reflux. And so this was a study that actually was supposed to be presented um, at the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that was supposed to be presented at the AUA um, in next month, actually, that got canceled, um, that was obtained from the Society of Fetal Urology Hydronephrosis Registry. So this is six centers um, that all have combined their data um, to look at various um, issues. And what this study looked at was the risk of um, having a UTI with, um, with only isolated hydronephrosis. So again, no other factors, no hydroureter um, or duplication anomalies, just looking at hydronephrosis alone. Um, what we found is that, of course, um, the, the largest majority of these patients were male, as you can imagine. But the rate of um, UTIs um, in this cohort was 5%. And it was no different whether you, you, you were on antibiotic prophylaxis or not. What we did find, though, was that the UTI risk was highest for females um, at 11%, um, a little bit less for uncircumcised males at 5%, and then really the lowest uh, for circumcised males at 1.5%, with, again, no differences on if you were on antibiotics or not. Um, we also did find that, um, yes, the risk of um, of um, having a UTI was slightly higher for higher grades of hydronephrosis um, compared to lower grades, but it did not meet statistical significance. So again, um, potentially grade of hydronephrosis may not be um, a factor that will increase the risk of UTI. Um, in a subsequent study that again is not quite um, published yet, we have find, found that having a mega ureter, so a, a, a dilated ureter greater than seven millimeters also will increase your risk of having a UTI. So maybe these are the people who we should be considering getting um, a VCUG in, given their risk is gonna be a bit higher. Uh, so the consensus, um, there's really no strong evidence to, to support criteria for obtaining um, a VCUG in cases of prenatal hydronephrosis. Um, I pulled in this um, table from um, JPU from 2014. This was, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, but this was um, published from a multidisciplinary group that came up with the new grading system, the UTD or the um, 
urinary tract dilation, um, risk stratification, um, to grade um, hydronephrosis slightly differently from the traditional, most, mostly people use SFU. Um, but this is looking more at um, risks um, that might be involved with the cases of hydronephrosis. So I won't go into the details of the different grading system, but you can see here the low risk categories here. Um, P2 is considered intermediate risk and P3 is high risk. But as you can see here, um, when it comes to getting a VCUG for having a low risk or intermediate risk, the, um, the recommendation for getting a VCG is at the discretion of the clinician. So again, no one has great criteria for um, when you should be getting a VCG, but um, certainly if you are in the high risk group of getting a UTI, then you should certainly consider getting one. Um, I always say that it's, it's important to counsel parents on the risks of UTI, uh, of reflux if it's undiagnosed, mostly um, that having reflux in and of itself is not a problem, but if you have a UTI with reflux um, and it's high grade reflux, there's always that risk of renal scarring and that's what we wanna prevent in these cases. Um, so now a little bit more on the controversies in the diagnosis of reflux after a UTI. So um, probably most people at this point, again, with the um, DMSA scan being a little bit harder to get, I'm guessing most people take this bottom-up approach, but I will say at some point, again, along my um, track of training, the top-down approach was becoming a very popular approach, um, and I think it's more of a European approach, um, as you'll see in a bit. But um, the bottom-up approach, um, the algorithm for that um, means that if you have a child who has a febrile UTI, what you would do is get a VCG. And again, this is a pretty traditional approach. If you have high grade reflux, then certainly you might um, consider getting a DMSA scan to look for renal scarring, um, given that risk is a bit higher for, for high grade reflux. Um, the advantages of doing this approach is that you're certainly gonna diagnose that reflux. Um, the disadvantages of doing that is that you may be detecting clinically insignificant reflux. And again, this is the perfect example of how this is similar to prostate cancer in that you may have reflux, but it may never cause you any problems. So do you really want to know that you actually have it? Um, again, um, the top-down approach was to sort of mitigate some of those issues um, where this algorithm runs that if you have a child with a febrile UTI, then the first imaging you would get is a DMSA scan. And if that DMSA scan was abnormal, then your rate of finding clinically significant reflux might be higher. Um, so then you should probably get a VCG in those cases. If you have a normal DMSA scan, um, then you should stop um, and not get any VCG and just follow them expectantly um, unless they develop a second um, febrile UTI, which um, then you might want to get a VCG. The advantages, again, is that you're going to find the more clinically significant cases. Uh, you're certainly going to reduce the risk of um, radiate or the, the reduce your radiation exposure as well as the anxiety that comes along with the VCUG um, study. Um, and you're going to potentially avoid a VCUG in greater than 50% of screened patients. The disadvantages are that you will um, miss about 5 to 30% of cases of reflux. Uh, and keep in mind that if you don't know that you have reflux, then these kids are likely to not be on antibiotic prophylaxis. So again, if they sustain a second event, then um, you potentially might cause more problems with um, kidney damage, again, assuming you have high grade reflux. Um, so finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the controversies in the guidelines. Probably most of you know mostly about the AUA guidelines and maybe the AAP. Um, we probably talk a little bit less about the NICE guidelines, um, mostly because they're um, the NICE guidelines and the EAU guidelines because they're European. Um, but I'll talk about um, what those specifically say. Um, so again, the NICE guidelines are from the UK. Um, it was last updated in 2018. And this is looking at the management of UTI in children under 16 years of age. Uh, they talk about the diagnosis, um, so they say that in children with um, an unexplained fever of uh, 38 degrees, um, you should certainly obtain um, a urine within 24 hours. They actually recommend that a clean catch is um, the recommended method um, of collection. Um, secondarily, they said if you can't get a clean catch, then their recommendations is actually to use what they call a urine collection pad. 
um, which they specifically say in there that could include a cotton ball um, or even gauze. Uh, that's something that I think varies um, in what we practice in the U.S. At least I, I don't use cotton balls or gauze pads for sure. Um, maybe some other people do in the country, but, um, but um, that's probably something that differs in the European guidelines. Um, and then they say the last method of collection that they would recommend is catheter or aspiration, which I think we are more likely to catheterize. Um, then use these urine collection pads. Um, they do stratify um, the diagnosis into less than three months of age, three months to three years, and then greater than three years. Um, essentially for all of them though, they do say that you should get a microscopy and a culture if a UTI is suspected, and then a dipstick may be more appropriate for those who are greater than three years of age. Uh, they uh, stratify into age for um, various reasons. I think they're looking for uh, the people who are going to be a little bit more high risk of problems if there is reflux in the future. So um, these guidelines are separated into um, younger than six months of age, um, six months to three years of age, and then greater than three months of age, which again I'll go into. But it's, it's interesting because based on your age, that's how the guidelines vary in what they would recommend from an imaging standpoint. Um, so um, here what they um, also break it down into is that columns of if you respond well to treatment within 48 hours, you're kind of categorized into one category as sort of, a, I guess, a good risk category. And then they talk about atypical UTI versus a recurrent UTI. And I'll go through what those definitions are. Um, but essentially for all of these cases, again, if you're younger than six months of age, they do recommend an ultrasound at various time points. So again, for atypical or recurrent, they recommend you get this um, during the acute um, infection. And then if you're um, responding well to the treatment, then they recommend it at a later time point, but all of them recommend an ultrasound. Um, you can see here that for atypical or recurrent infections, they recommend a DMSA scan um, at four to six months following the acute infection. Um, the reason why they're probably specifying this time point, I didn't mention um, when I talked about the DMSA scan, um, is that it usually takes about four to six months for a chronic scar to um, become a scar. Um, so again, if you're in the month or maybe even two months um, range after the acute event, you might still see the pyelonephritis um, evidence. But when you get farther out from that initial event, then it may either go back to normal and you'll never know that there was a problem, or again, roughly around six, um, four to six months, you might start to see that um, chronic scars. So that's the reason I think that they mentioned um, a four to six time um, frame. Um, so you'd get a DMSA scan um, as well as um, the, an MCUG uh, is the same thing as a BCUG. Um, so they recommend again in the younger um, babies that you would get both of these studies. So definitions. So an atypical UTI, what that means to them is that um, any child who is seriously ill, and they actually have criteria for what that actually means, it usually means you have to have certain constitutional symptoms. Some of them have to do with sort of things like rigors, um, respiratory rate increases, stuff like that. Um, but you have to have meet criteria within um, what they call, and you can again look at what those are you know, furthermore in the guidelines. Um, poor urine flow, any kind of abdominal or bladder mass, a raised creatinine um, sepsis episode, um, failure to respond to treatment, within 48 hours or infections that are non E. coli um, related. So these are all considered atypical um, infections that might put you at higher risk. Um, and then a recurrent UTI, so they consider anyone with two or more episodes of acute pylo, so upper tract infections. Um, they also say one event of a pylo episode plus one or more episodes of cystitis or lower urinary tract infections. Or if you have three um, cystitis episodes, so you can um, never have an acute um, pylo episode, but just have three or more cystitis episodes, that would consider you in the recurrent UTI category. So going to the next age range, so again, six months uh, to three years of age. Um, again, if you are in the atypical or recurrent um, UTI category, they would recommend you get an ultrasound at various time points. Um, not if you respond well to treatment. Um, and then, of course, they recommend that you get a DMSA scan, again, for any of these um, unique infections, the atypical or recurrent. Um, mostly, again, um, this is probably a little more of the top-down approach that they're going with. 
Um, they do say that um, a VCUG um, could be considered if you have dilation on the ultrasound for urine flow, non E. coli infection, or a family history of reflux. So, again, they're a little more conservative in um, getting that VCUG um, in these cases. Um, and then for the cases of um, children in three years that, um, or older, um, they would recommend, again, um, same thing as the, the middle age group um, where there's an ultrasound at various time points for these funny infections. Um, and then they only recommend that you get a DMSA scan um, in um, cases for recurrent UTIs. So I think, again, the rationale of this is that there are a lot of children three years or older who are sort of in that potty training or bladder and bowel dysfunction um, category where they're less concerned about reflux issues, but probably could be more related to bladder and bowel dysfunction. And so um, they're, they're a little more conservative in not getting some of these other studies. Um, so they're really increasing the yield for the, for the VCG study. Um, this is the European um, guidelines. Um, this was um, from 2012, and they broke it down um, for getting a VCUG, um, whether you are, again, diagnosed, as I mentioned before, with prenatal hydronephrosis versus from a UTI event. Um, so in prenatal cases, they reserve a VCUG for bilateral high-grade hydronephrosis in a duplex kidney with hydronephrosis, ureteroceles, ureteral uh, dilation or abnormal bladders, of course, probably looking for um, push through the urethral valve. And they say that a VCUG is optional for all other conditions. Um, they also say that you should consider it if you're symptomatic with a UTI, which probably gets into this category here, where um, the European guidelines say that for the first proven febrile UTI in kids aged zero to two, they would recommend a VCUG. Um, they also do say that if reflux is present, a DMSA scan um, should be considered, um, especially if you do have high grade reflux. And then they say that a top down approach is an option as well. Um, furthermore, in these guidelines, of course, they talk about the various treatment um, plans for reflux. So, of course, you could take the conservative approach with watchful waiting. Um, you can use either intermittent or continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, certainly would want to do bladder rehabilitation for bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, circumcisions are an option to reduce the risk of infection. Um, and then follow-up imaging, uh, certainly you would um, consider getting a biannual or annual ultrasound, and then less frequently you would get a cystography or a DMSA scan. Um, tr uh, surgical, surgical treatment um, would be an option if you're having frequent uh, breakthrough urinary tract infections, if you have persistent high-grade reflux, abnormal renal parenchyma, maybe indicating renal scarring, um, and then of course parental decisions, and then they talk about the various um, modalities for um, surgical treatment of reflux, which um, again I won't get into. Um, this is the AAP guideline, so the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. Um, it was initially written in 2011, I believe, uh, or, or last updated in 2011. And then more recently, they put a, a revision um, in 2016. And I'll talk about what that difference is. Um, but again, this is looking at the initial febrile UTI in children between 2 and 24 months. Um, it does recommend that you get a urine by a catheter versus a supercubic aspiration. They specifically say um, a bag specimen is not adequate uh, for an accurate diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis is made by pyuria in 50,000 colonies of a single um, organism by catheterized specimen. Uh, you should treat them with um, 7 to 14 days of antibiotics. An ultrasound should be performed, and then they specifically say that a VCUG is not recommended after the first UTI, but it's recommended if the ultrasound reveals hydronephrosis, scarring, or other suspicious findings. Um, they also say, um, quote, they say further evaluation is recommended for the recurrence of febrile UTI. They um, then go into the meat of the paper that talks about um, that means a VCUG. So certainly, if you have multiple events, you might want to get a VCUG. And then there's an older recommendation, um, again, from the 2011 guidelines that got erased from the 2016 guidelines that say antibiotic prophylaxis is not supported to prevent uh, febrile UTIs with or without reflux. Um, and then I have a poll question. 
for that. Um, so why did the recommendation against antibiotic prophylaxis go away? And I have a couple of various um, trials here. Um, I'll just talk about the last guideline really fast and we'll go back to the poll question. Um, but after UTI, um, parents should seek prompt medical evaluation within 48 hours for future febrile illnesses because again, the sooner you can treat these infections, the better off a child would be. Um, so again, we'll look at the results of that. Um, so most of you guys, 76% of you said the river trial. Um, so I actually forgot what all these other trials mean since I'm in the pediatric world. I had to ask my residents what are other trials that I could throw out there as, as false answers. Um, so um, mom's trial is the other one that I um, also would be familiar with, um, which is looking at um, prenatal closure of myelomeningocele and all these other trials are adult urology trials. But the river trial was the one that looked at antibiotic prophylaxis with Bactrim versus um, placebo to see if there was a reduction in the risk of UTIs. Um, and in, again, in that study, they found about 50%, um, uh, there was a 50% reduction in the recurrence of UTIs with um, Bactrim. Um, and so because of that study, the AAP got rid of those guidelines, the antibiotic prophylaxis is not beneficial. And then finally, I'll go through the AUA guidelines. Um, so this one, again, was previously um, uh, last updated 2010 and then more recently 2017. Um, I looked and I didn't see any major um, differences in those two guidelines. Um, but um, again, it, it breaks it down into sort of the different stages of um, diagnosing reflux. So uh, initially in the evaluation of a child with reflux, the standard is that you should certainly get a height, weight, blood pressure, and a creatinine if there's bilateral renal um, abnormalities. They do recommend you get a UA to look for protein, um, protein and bacteria, um, and then a culture if your UA is positive. They also recommend you get an ultrasound to assess um, for structural issues, and then a DMSA um, scan is optional. And then of course they recommend a, um, an assessment of bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, so again, the goals of the initial management of a child with reflux, um, one is to prevent recurring um, febrile UTIs. Um, of course, we want to prevent renal injuries, probably one of the most important things, um, and to minimize the morbidity and treatment um, of treatment and follow-up. So the AUA guidelines break up um, how they recommend antibiotics uh, based on age. So if you are less than one year of age, um, they recommend antibiotic prophylaxis for those who are diagnosed with reflux who had a febrile UTI. Um, they also say that antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for those cases who are diagnosed with um, reflux who have high-grade reflux, so grade three to five, and these are again in the cases of prenatal hydronephrosis cases who did not have a febrile UTI. They say it's optional to offer antibiotic prophylaxis for those with grades one to two reflux um, in these cases. Um, it's optional to offer a circumcision in males with reflux. Um, and then again, in children who are greater than one year of age, these are for cases with a UTI um, as well as reflux. So uh, first and foremost, you have to treat the bladder and bowel dysfunction. And of course, there's um, different ways that you can do that. Um, and then they recommend that antibiotic prophylaxis um, for those cases with reflux who have bladder and bowel dysfunction. And they, they say it's optional for those who do not have bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, and of course, surgical intervention may also be used. Um, follow-up management for a child with reflux. Um, so this is just um, annual follow-ups with a blood, blood pressure check, height and weight, a UA, um, plus or minus the culture. Um, they say you should get a, a renal ultrasound every year to look for a renal growth and then a VCUG versus an RNC every uh, one to two years. Um, and then they say uh, that um, cystography is optional if an observational approach is used. Uh, Follow-up uh, cystography may be done after one year of age in those with grades one to two hydronephrosis, um, basically saying that the rate of resolution is much quicker um, and higher for those, so you can certainly do it after one year of age. Um, they also say that a single normal VCUG can establish um, resolution. So for example, if you're following a child with reflux 
and they have a normal VCUG on a follow-up, then they're not recommending that you get any further um, VCUGs because that really says that that reflux has gone away. Um, and then a DMSA scan is recommended when your ultrasound is abnormal. Um, so again, if you're concerned about um, a small kidney that might have renal scarring, um, in cases of a breakthrough UTI in high-grade reflux, those are also um, risk factors for having renal scarring or um, having an elevated creatinine. Um, interventions um, for a child with a breakthrough UTI. So they say if you have a breakthrough UTI, um, you should change your therapy. So that might include surgical intervention or just to change the antibiotic to something different if you have a single event. Um, if you're not on antibiotic prophylaxis and you have a have a UTI with reflux, then they say you should be started on antibiotic um, prophylaxis. Um, it would be optional if it was for a non-febrile UTI. Um, Post-operative imaging after intervention. So um, they recommend you get a renal ultrasound um, after um, open versus endoscopic surgery. I would also say that that would go for a robotic surgery or, or laparoscopic surgery as well. Um, primarily what you're looking for in these cases is to look for obstruction. Um, so we wanna make sure that there's no new major hydronephrosis that might indicate that you made your tunnel too long or that you put in too much um, bulking agent. Um, and then they recommend that you get a post-op um, cystography after endoscopic um, injections, um, and they say it's optional for open surgery. I think the rationale for this is that we know that open surgery is pretty effective. There's a, probably about a 97% success rate, so we don't necessarily need to get cystography in those cases, but for endoscopic um, surgery, it's a little bit less known um, of your own results, um, so you should get that. I also would argue for, again, minimally invasive surgery, you should also get um, a VCG as well, or a CEDA study. Um, and then for cases of management um, after resolution of the reflux, that could either be spontaneous resolution or with surgery. It's optional to obtain um, a blood pressure, a height and weight, and um, a urinalysis. Um, it's recommended that um, if you have an abnormal um, kidney by ultrasound or DMSA scan that you should get all of these things anyway. Um, if um, you do have a febrile UTI after resolution, you should evaluate, um, again, for bladder and bowel dysfunction, or you can certainly look for a recurrence of the, um, the reflux as well. Um, it's also recommended that you talk about hypertension risk, um, the risk of renal functional loss, uh, recurrent UTIs, and familiar reflux issues in siblings and, offering, uh, um, and off, uh, offspring as well. Um, I have, I think, my final poll question. Um, this is actually a SASB question that I like to ask my residents. Um, so this is a two-month-old girl who has bilateral grade four to five reflux. An appropriate screening option for her two-year-old asymptomatic brother is, and you have some options there. Um, so most of you guys got this, um, it would be a renal bladder ultrasound. Um, so again, I would agree with that. It's a pretty minimally invasive um, study to get um, that you'd want to do a screening ultrasound first. Um, certainly if you had a UTI or, or, or if the brother had a UTI, then you can consider getting a VCUG. And then so in conclusion, um, the diagnosis and management of reflux can be very con conflicting. As you can see here, the guidelines do vary um, probably based on where you live. Um, it's probably the most important factors that um, in reflux that you protect the kidneys from febrile events um, and hence the risk of renal scarring. And of course, with everything in the AUA and the AUA guidelines, um, shared decision, decision making and, and appropriate counseling to parents is very important. Um, so that is the end of my talk. Um, I'm supposed to show the slides so you all can um, do an evaluation, I believe. And I will hand it, I guess, back over to Yi. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kern, for an awesome talk. Um, as you mentioned, a very controversial topic and uh, as reflected by all the questions. We have a few questions about your contrast enhanced uh, the U.S. Yeah. 
I think people are just interested in sort of more about the details, sort of how long it takes to get the images, how good is it for valuing the urethra, and sort of what the agent is used. Yeah, so, um, so you know, the agent has been around, my understanding, um, used for other, um, other issues. So primarily, I think it was used to look for like liver lesions for, for tumor purposes. Um, it then started to be used um, in the bladder. Um, as you know, it's, um, it's um, cycled into the bladder through the catheter. Um, it's a really fast study. Um, so overall, um, it's pretty similar to just getting a standard um, really ultrasound or a VCUG, maybe a little bit quicker. Um, but how that the setup looks like is that you can be on a stretcher. Um, you have the patient there, the parents are right next to them. Um, and then you have your ultrasound tech um, who's scanning the patient continuously. So um, what you're doing is that you put the catheter in, you infuse the bladder with this contrast agent, and immediately what they're seeing is that you'll see the bladder start to bubble up and it becomes that orangey color, the yellow color. Um, and then what you can do is you can start to actually see reflux immediately. So um, because you can see the contrast going into the ureters if they are refluxing for which then the ultrasound tech will then do a, an ultrasound of the kidney itself to grade the reflux. Um, then when the patient, again, when there's enough contrast in the bladder, um, patients will start to void. And we, we can actually see them voiding prior to them actually voiding externally, which is um, another benefit um, of doing this study. Um, but you can actually see great, great detail of the urethra. I was a little skeptical, I'm not gonna lie, um, just because, um, it's so hard to see um, urethras on ultrasound, in my opinion, but when you see this contrast go through, um, the detail of it is really great. It's very similar to an um, fluoroscopy, so you can actually see if there's DSD or dysfunctional voiding or if that spinning top urethra that sometimes we look for. You can see the bulging of it. You can actually start to see vaginal voiding on it as well because you see that, um, that detail of it on the ultrasound. Um, so it's, um, again, I was very skeptical when um, it was first introduced to us. Um, so we have a PEDS radiologist who came from CHOP and um, CHOP really has um, utilized this, um, probably one of the first peoples um, to, to really start to use this or at least they published um, highly on it. Um, and so we were really, um, um, it, it was really used to our advantage that we have um, this new PEDS radiologist who um, brought it to our hospital um, and it's been fantastic. Parents love it. Great. Um, there's a, a few questions about antibiotics um, and treatment of UTIs that you discussed in the setting. So one of the questions is, given the different guideline recommendations, what's your preferred approach to febrile UTI and VCUG? Yeah, so I think, so again, I think it's very different. Um, so if we're talking about um, a child who gets a febrile UTI, um, and I'm wondering if there is um, uh, reflux. I do tend to go for the first UTI. Um, I do tend to get a VCUG um, because at least that gives me an idea of um, of what their risk is going to be of high, you know, of course I'm concerned about high grade reflux for the most part. Um, again, I will say it, it makes me feel a little bit better that I'm um, allowing these patients to now have a this study as opposed to a VCUG because Again, there's no radiation to it. It's really, the problem is the catheterization and the risk of UTI from the catheterization. That's probably the biggest pitfall um, for, from a CEVA study. So I feel a little bit better about getting these studies than a VCUG. Um, I do typically follow the AUA guidelines in that um, I, um, for lower grades of reflux, I'm less inclined to, to start antibiotics. Um, for higher grades, I am. And then, of course, if you have bladder and bowel dysfunction, I definitely am. Um, I do, I will say for cases of prenatal hydronephrosis, if we diagnose reflux um, in those cases, I tend to put everyone on antibiotics, um, mostly because I think for infants, um, your risk of a UTI is your highest. So in that first year of life, if anything, I just want to protect them from getting a UTI because they're so young. Um, so I put everyone on the antibiotics, um, no matter what their grade of reflux is for prenatal cases. Um, I will say I'm very selective, though, in who I order a VCUG or a CEVA study on in those cases. I don't, you know, I used to, again, I was taught that grades two to um, four of reflux, uh, sorry, two to four of hydronephrosis, I would get um, a VCUG on for everyone that was in my training. Um, I don't do that at this point. I really look for those high-risk factors that, again, that I sort of studied in my fellowship um, to decide if I'm going to get a VCG or 
Great. Uh, a follow-up question to that. Uh, at what age do you typically stop antibiotic prophylaxis for patients that don't worsen? Yeah, so it will depend. Um, for the most part, again, let's say that I've gotten them out to, um, I usually repeat um, a VCG or CVIS after potty training because, again, I think that that's the highest time that you might get in trouble with UTIs. Let's say you're um, beyond potty training um, and I think you have no bladder and bowel dysfunction. I think you're doing a pretty good job. Um, it depends on the grade of reflux. So if, and, and again, depends on gender. So if you're a boy who's circumcised, you don't have bladder and bowel dysfunction, and let's say you have grade five reflux, grade four reflux, I might push you out maybe a year, maybe get you to age six, but then around age six, I probably will stop them to see how they'll do because I recognize they may not ever, um, improve that reflux, but they may never ever get in trouble with it either. Again, if you're a circumcised male. So I usually will give you a trial to see if you can come off the antibiotics. Um, again, if you are, let's say you're um, a girl and you don't have any bladder and bowel dysfunction um, and you have high grade reflux, I might push you a little bit later. I don't have any rhyme or reason to be honest. Um, it's not evidence-based. It's all about those risk factors. So if you have any of those risk factors, I'm going to push you a little farther with the antibiotics, or I might stop you immediately after potty training if you're, again, low grade reflux boy who's circumcised. I might stop you right off the bat, it's right after potty training. Great. Um, what's your approach for choice of antibiotics? Do you rotate them, or how do you sort of pick and choose? Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes, um, again, you'll learn, all of you will learn this in practice. Um, it's not based on evidence, but what's available. So lately, we've had a really hard time getting um, nitroferrantoin in our area. Um, so normally, I would like to put people on nitroferrantoin because I think it's a great coverage medication. Um, there's been a lot of Bactrim resistances um, that have been about. Um, but it's really hard to get. Um, one, they, uh, the pharmacies don't have them a lot. And two, the insurances won't cover them a lot. So unfortunately, I go to Bactrim a lot, mostly because of availability. Um, but I think it just depends on sort of what your resistance pattern is in your area, what your availability is in your area as well. Great. Um, there's a question about how you approach the combination for patients that have both reflux and UPJ obstruction. Which one do you tackle first and how, how do you manage that evaluation? Yeah, um, I usually do tackle the UPJ obstruction first um, because to me that's reflux, again, as I keep saying over and over, it's very much like the prostate cancer. For the most part, people do not tend to get in trouble with um, reflux unless it's really, really high grade. Um, so I do tend to tackle the UPJ obstruction first and then kind of um, expectantly follow the reflux to see if that can get better by itself. And only if you demonstrate you're getting into trouble with the reflux do I, do I tackle that. Um, it's funny because again, um, I don't feel like I'm that old, but in my, um, residency, I was doing, and again, I, I was in Boston, so I was at Boston Children's, high volume place. Um, I was doing anti-reflux surgeries on a daily, daily basis. It was so frequent that we were doing them. Um, and I think it's changed a lot. Um, we've learned that you don't necessarily have to operate on all these um, cases at this point. Great. Uh, to follow up with the reflux questions, are there any data on children with resolution of reflux that are found to have recurrence of reflux after they've resolved on, on on your follow-up? Um, I think it happens. Um, I, I definitely have seen it. And again, predominantly, those are the cases who develop bladder and bowel dysfunction uh, or have had some underlining bit of it and it really came to um, fruition at a later time. So most of the kids, I've had a couple kids I've seen who had resolution of the reflux and then they came back to me with more UTIs, had new reflux, and it's all mostly because of bladder and bowel dysfunction. Great. Uh, there was a question about, uh, given the possible increased stone risks in patients with early antibiotic exposure, does that change your sort of threshold to prescribe prophylaxis? Um, so it does, it does not, um, mostly because I'm in pediatrics, I don't worry so much about stones. <laughs> um, but uh, no, unfortunately, it does not, it does not change my management. Great. And that question about the AUA, the 2020 abstract, I think that was slide 15. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, were the antibiotic prophylaxis versus none comparisons of the UTI rate matched by hydronephrosis severity? I think it was just a clarification question. 
Yeah, so um, so the rates of UTI are higher. Um, I think it was quoted at eight percent in um, grades uh, or higher grades of reflux versus, or sorry, higher grades of hydronephrosis um, versus lower grades, grades one and two. Um, but it, when we did the stats on it, um, there was no um, significant values. So I think we basically are saying that um, it's really not that much different in the grand scheme. Great. Um, there's a question about the AAP guidelines. Do you have any comment on why the criteria is for 50,000 uh, for a positive culture in pyuria? Do you know um, so, you know, I think it's because it's a calf specimen. Um, so that's the criteria I go by as well. Um, I think most people, well, I guess, well, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. But at least I go by that um, in my team here at UVA goes by. Um, so it's because it's from a calf specimen. Um, I think the 100,000 um, number comes from clean catch. That's mostly from the CDC guidelines, I believe. It's like um, uses 100,000, but it's from a clean catch. So because it's from a calf specimen, I think they, they drop that value down. Great. And a question of if you do anything to try to lessen the chances of antibiotic resistance uh, for, for these long-term patients? Um, I don't. Um, I don't. Uh, there's certainly people who talk about probiotics and stuff like that to increase your gut flora. I don't know that any of that stuff works. Um, I don't know that there's anything you could do to prevent the, the resistance pattern that happens. Great. There's uh, a few questions on imaging. Um, do you order any other imaging other than an ultrasound during the acute e febrile UTI episode? No, I do not. Okay, and then a question on whether or not an MRI can can see renal scarring, and sort of uh, why or why not? If you um, so it probably can. Um, so you know, people do use MRUs, for example, um, as a surrogate for DMSA scans. Um, they actually can get a functional. Um, it's very similar actually to a DMSA scan where you can get a functional um, uh, relative value to one another on those MRIs. Um, we do them occasionally here at UVA. Um, it's definitely institution dependent. Um, some people are more MRU heavy, some people are more DMSA heavy, depending on, again, if you have certain um, equipment and, and tracers. Um, but you can get a functional value um, from a MRI. And a question on VCGs for low dose VCGs. Um, this commenter mentioned that radiologists, they're the radiologists that say that it's less radiation than an RNC. And just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, it, it definitely depends. Um, I, I don't know those actual numbers. Um, I would say by far and away, um, when you are at an institution that has um, sort of pediatrics or, or a little more pediatric friendly, they're going to use low dose um, numbers. So I know that again, because my peach radiologist came from CHOP, he's very cognizant about that. He always criticizes the VCGs that are done at the outside community and saying, you know, he's like, look at this study. They got literally spot images on all of these um, for, for this entire study. And that's a lot um, higher radiation. Again, I'm not a um, radiologist or a physicist, so I don't know exactly the numbers. Um, but I do think that's probably true that you can do a VCG that's pretty low low-dose radiation in general. Um, I just don't know those exact numbers. Great. There's a follow-up question on, uh, do you change antibiotic prophylaxis choice based on prior cultures? So if breakthrough has just in the back room, do you then use a different med for prophylaxis? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. So I do follow cultures, especially if there's a breakthrough event. I definitely want to see that prior culture to know if it's something I should change antibiotics for. I think it's a very good thing to do. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for now, which is great. Uh, thanks for answering everything. We will still send this to you and we can post some more details up on the website um, and the slides and the recording will be shared. Uh, for everyone else, please join us uh, 10 minutes after the hour for the next talk. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kern. Great. Thanks for having me.